Wow. A little bit of garlic, not too much. Jolly Ranchers. Jolly, jo Jolly Ranchers, mint. Yeah. Uh, this is what we call a, a hop rubbing. It's pretty much what it sounds like. The hop flour has been pressed out into a highly compressed sort of cake, and you rub them very vigorously between your hands, and as your hands kind of heat up, the oils heat up, the essential oils, and then you take in your impressions. Wow, that make a nice pale ale. Are you getting like dill? Yeah. Dill? These are all experimental hot varieties, so they're not commercially available yet. And what we want to do is say back to the grower, hey, you know, these maybe aren't doing anything for us, but these are pretty awesome. I got cocoa as well. Kind of an almost chocolatey sort of thing that I thought would yes. be, you know, would be really nice in a black ale or those winter beers that we were working on. Um, I could see this really kind of grabbing onto roast. It smells like weed. Now, you don't want to get on a plane with this, uh, you know, in your bag. Yeah, Brooklyn is a symbol of enterprise and entrepreneurship and, and creativity now. And my contention is it's always been this way. A lot of people say to me, did you ever imagine the brewery would be this successful? And my answer is, hell yes. I mean, what? that was the whole idea, right? You got to have great beer. We have incredible beer. You got to have great design. And you got to have a lot of luck. You know, I don't know how many beers we've done since we started, but it must be in the hundreds. And that's an incredible testament to the creativity of Garrett Oliver. Ah. I was told that we weren't doing this till tomorrow. What we have operating here is basically a giant French press. <laughs> you know, I used to brew at home all the time. Now I inflict all of my ideas on the general public. But you're saying you're doing a test. How many pounds do you have in? This is what Rob set up, so I'm not really sure. We're just trying to see if the, the actual press is going to work. All right, well, we shall see. There's you know, a million little things going on over here. Uh, a whole range of beers that we call the ghost bottles, which are all the things that we don't sell. Some of them actually later turn into stuff that, uh, that ends up making it, it, its way out to the public. But to some extent, it also doesn't matter. Some things are just totally not reproducible. That's the most exciting stuff. Uh, we opened this in 1996. It had a floor which we thought was kind of powdered concrete. It turned out this had been an old matzo factory. So somewhere under our feet, there is a layer of matzo dough. Basically, you got two brew houses, which are only a few feet apart. And the word brew house is kind of like the word kitchen. The room is the brew house, but then each set of brewing equipment is itself called a brew house. This one is almost completely manual. We still run it, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, this, which we installed in 2011, is the main one that we're using. When you say automation, it means that it's gonna get some things done, but you still have to keep an eye on it. What you don't have to do anymore is sit there and say, okay, in six minutes, I have to put the hops into the kettle. You can be over there figuring out how are we gonna do this, how are we gonna do that, you know, actual brewing. I went to school for film, got out, and my best friend said, hey, I got a work permit, and I'm moving to London. You know, it's like, you want to move to London? I actually ended up working as a stage manager. I ran University of London Union. And we put on all kinds of concerts. I took the Ramones bowling. <laughs> but I was also falling in love with beer. I discovered there was this whole other world and that beer was actually fascinating. And it was when I got back to the United States and found that we didn't have beer yet that I started brewing at home. Not because I was interested in making beer, I was brewing beer in order to have some beer. What hop is this? Uh, let's see, we've got uh, Summit, Palisade, Amarillo. Slightly fruitier, rounder, fuller. It's nice. We're not doing like focus group, yeah, trying to, to figure out the mind of America. You know, we, we make, stuff we like and then we go out and sell it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I don't think musicians generally go out and ask people what their music should sound like and we don't ask people what our beer should taste like. 
When I got out of college, I had a degree in English. So I went to work for newspapers, and I got up in my head I wanted to cover a war. So I started studying Arabic and said I wanted to go to the Middle East. I was in Iran covering the revolution and the hostage crisis. I was abducted in Lebanon in 1980, a very nasty incident. I moved to Cairo. I was sitting behind President Sadat when he was assassinated. But when I was there, I met American diplomats who worked in Saudi Arabia, where they have Islamic law, no alcoholic beverages. And these guys were avid home brewers. So I got into home brewing. So how long has it been lagering? It's been about four weeks. Um, you know, we brew them about like a day apart. My wife got fed up with being the wife of a war correspondent. So we decided to come back to New York and I was making beer at home, serving it to all my friends and neighbors. And eventually, with my downstairs neighbor, Tom Potter, a young guy with an MBA, I persuaded him to quit his job and start the Brooklyn Brewery with me. So this is what we're testing as the winter seasonal. It is a possible version. Looks nice. It's got great foam. I'll give you some of my foam. <laughs> Garrett went to work for Manhattan Brewery, and I told him, when we build our brewery in Williamsburg, I, I want you to, to be part of it. You know, nice and dry. It's beautiful. I normally wouldn't finish it, but I'm gonna finish it. <laughs> oh, I'm, not, I'm not even close, man. <laughs> I think that what we're doing now is much more craft than what we were doing seven or eight years ago. We had no idea how to do the stuff that we're doing now. All the bottle re-fermentation stuff, all of the, the, the barrel aging stuff. This can hold about 2,000 barrels at once. Beer is much more culinary in many ways than wine is. Beer has ingredients, we have ideas. You take a thing like a uh, coffee porter. So the first thing is the base beer. Now the whole concept is take this beer, barrel age this beer, get the coffee from El Salvador, Blue Bottle does the roast, and then we built a giant French press to do a cold brew, take this concentrated coffee, blend it into the beer which has come out of these barrels. And then that all has to come together into a thing that tastes really good. Yeah, I talked to Mark about uh, the Black Ops barrels, how we want to reuse them, so okay. he knows. The whole barrel program used to be just me. Now I kind of have a partner, and we just sit there and bounce things back and forth. I have a master's degree in brewing and distilling from Harry Watt, and it focused on barrel aging. You know your best cow barrel, that really nice one? Yeah. So I put half local one and half kettle sour together, and I added a little bit of Chardonnay oat smoked sea salt. Do you taste it already, like just the blend? I tasted it uh, about three weeks ago. What do you think? Awesome. I look at a team photo from three, four years ago, and there are like seven of us, and now there are 25 of us. The growth has been absolutely exponential. The first 10 years were very difficult. I mean, we were functionally bankrupt for many of those years. But at that time, you know, 1984, 85, all the beer in America, it was controlled by the big three, Bud Coors and Miller. The thing was, we're gonna take one kind of everything, we're gonna make it as cheap as possible, and then we're gonna ram it down your throat with advertising. The big breweries were getting bigger, and the regional breweries, the smaller breweries, were being run out of business. When I, I told Tom, uh, you know, we should start a brewery in Brooklyn, he said, are you kidding? He had studied the beer industry. He said, how can we compete with the big guys in, in this market? And my answer was, we're not gonna compete with the big guys. We're gonna compete with the imports. We weren't drinking American mainstream beer. We were drinking imported beer. The amazing thing is, almost 30 years later, imports are like 13% of the U.S. market. Craft beer is more than 10% and growing very rapidly. So tastes have changed and are changing in America. I don't think craft beer, you know, it's not a trend and it's not a fad. You know, what it actually represents is a return to normality. If you go back to Brooklyn in, say, 1890, we had 48 breweries that made 10% of all the beer in the United States. This was one of the great brewing capitals of the world. 
You know, people don't generally know that. You can, in just these bottles, see the evolution from the really old days of brewing in New York, which was British-based, to what happened later, where you have Franke, Grima, Hopeful, Von Hinken. They're all German. And very few of them really survived Prohibition. And then eventually, you know, they all went. The last brewery in Brooklyn closed in 1976, and before we opened, you know, here in, uh, in 96. You like my uh, hieroglyphs there? Those are from a tomb in ancient Egypt. And the guy, the translator there, is the world's foremost uh, Egyptologist. I met him in Egypt like 30 years ago, and he, gave, he sent me that uh, when, I, when I built the brewery. That's a true, that's like an ancient beer advertisement, right? We were brewing in upstate New York, so a lot of people said, why do you want to build a brewery in Brooklyn? It's going to be a hassle, it's going to be expensive. I knew that something was going to happen here. When we started the brewery, um, on our first day, first delivery day, we delivered to five customers. And Teddy's is the only one of the five still in existence. See these two planks over here? You turn that on its side and you slide the kegs down into there. It's not fun. <laughs> but you had always been doing like physical kind of work, right? I mean, when you were like- Foreign correspondent? Yeah. yeah, I used to have to lift my whiskey off the bar, you know. <laughs> you the new owner? Yeah, my name's yeah. Richard. Richard, Steve Hindi. You got a great place here. Thank you. A sentimental favorite of ours because on day one, you know, it was one of the first yeah. five customers. It's got some history, 1887. Yeah. <laughs> At that time, this is pre-gentrification in Williamsburg, right? And they had a bartender named Eddie Doyle. He was like old-time New York Irish bartender. And he loved Brooklyn Lager. He loved the idea that we were starting a brewery in Brooklyn. And so he made everyone try Brooklyn beer. People like that made us. When we decided to start the brewery, I said, I'll take care of the design and the story behind why Brooklyn, why Brooklyn Brewery. So I interviewed more than 30 design firms. And uh, People tried to flatter me, you know, like, oh, it's a brilliant idea, I want to be involved. But when I called Milton Glaser, this woman, Eva, answered the phone, and uh, she listened to me, and she said, do you know who Milton is? I mean, I knew he had done I Love New York logo, and I said, well, yeah, I hear he's pretty good, I want to talk to him. She said, well, he doesn't just talk to anyone calling here. So I started calling her every day. And after like two weeks of this, she said, you're not going to give up, are you? And I said, no, I want to talk to Milton Glaser. And she said, OK, here he is. My principle in life is not to work for people you don't like. And I liked Steve. They were going to call to be a Brooklyn Eagle. And I said, don't call it Brooklyn Eagle. Why exchange a bird for the entire borough? You could own Brooklyn. And that was probably the best single decision they ever made. The imagery was sort of based on a certain convention in German beer labeling. That idea of craft, of making things well and being precise, and then to also create a sense of liveliness and uh, iridescence. That peculiar kind of bee, which is sort of like a swirl of foam, that kind of image only occurs intuitively. This guy, by the way, is champion homebrew of the United States. It's a four-year process of barrel-aged sour beer. And now just telling him, like, we're going to run him around like a prize show pony. He has no idea what he's in for. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Do, do I have powers now? The magic is within you, Garrett. So one of our original 25 barrel fermenters over here. These are 100 barrel, and those are 200 barrel fermenters. We make about 10 times more beer here than we did in 2010. So the flow basically is from the brew house through fermentation, which happens in all of these rooms, through centrifuge and filtration at the back, back around up here to the bright tank area, and to the packaging line. This machine is pretty specialized. It's able to run regular bottles, 12-ounce bottles, but we also use it for doing our, uh, our bottle conditioned beer. So in that case, we run it like no carbonation, and it has a corker as well as a capper. 
you know, anything you see that comes in in this bottle, you know, runs on the same line as a 12 ounce bottle. It just needs uh, some uh, reset parts and uh, it's good to go. And then all this stuff goes through secondary fermentation uh, across the street. You know, we don't have like a farmhouse with tons of space, so you have to think about how does the beer flow? How do you get around? Increasingly, you have a brewery that runs like a kitchen. A few of you know me, some of you don't. My name is Garrett Oliver. I'm the brewmaster of Brooklyn Brewery. Uh, welcome to beer school. Several years back, I decided that it would be really fun if we got a chance to actually have brewers cooking the dinner. Oh, hell yes. My concepts of, of beer are essentially culinary. I have a chef's way of thinking about it. These are basically home cooking dishes, and they pair really well with the beer, and you kind of get people thinking about beer and food in a little bit different way. So what this is is a Goin spiced crab cake. I love crab cakes. They're often very bready. I don't like them very bready. Uh, and I just love the way this uh, all combines together and how it works with our beard. I mean, you can get fancy about it if you want, but all you have to do is mince this stuff up. If you don't chop enough, your crab cake's gonna fall apart because the pieces are gonna be too big. Nice filtration. Hey, they are. Nice filtration. Yeah. yeah. Blast was actually the name of my first homebrew. Double IPA, 8.4%, really dry. Now, one thing you probably have never thought about before is how nice these kinds of flavors works with hop character. I like spicy food with hops. It does accentuate the bitterness a bit, but I like the way it works, and they're both really, it's kind of like a tango. Beer is magical. You know, beer loosens people up, uh, it connects people, and it creates a convivial uh, atmosphere. It's an amazing uh, beverage. At the end of the day, the purpose of the beer is to be beautiful. You know, and that's what I'm trying to do. I love it. I love it more every day. <laughs> Here's the best thing in the world. Beer. <laughs>